today being Pentecost Sunday. What better day to dwell on the Holy Spirit? Part of a triune God that is often forgotten and misunderstood, yet present from the beginning of time. Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26 is what I will be taking you through today. Paul's practical application of grace. We will go through it worse by worse, as it's God's word that transforms our lives. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is still building his church. To live a God-ordained Christian life, I don't know about you, but I know I can't do it in my own strength, but by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is by the grace of God alone. I want you to picture with me a story that I heard about a pregnant reindeer walking through a forest, enjoying the day, enjoying the sunshine. And as she looked in front, she suddenly realized there was a lioness ready to pounce on her. Panic, she turned to her right, and there was a hunter with a gun pointed at her. She turned to her left, and there was a stream she knew she couldn't cross. So she thought she'd turn around, back the way she came. And the forest she had just come through was ablaze. So she looked heavenward to her creator God. In that moment, a flash of lightning, a roar of thunder, that caused the hunter to jolt. Pulling the trigger, a bullet graces the lioness, who turns her attention to the hunter. And as it pounced that way, the, clear, the path ahead was clear for the reindeer to leg it out. Life can sometimes seem that way, sometimes every day. There's just no way out. But... A Christian is defined as someone who lives under the guidance or direction and the power of the Holy Spirit. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says, be led by the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. It's a command not an option. The law has been a tutor to tell us where we go wrong. But the law could never save man. It was only ever meant to be a tutor and a guide. How then do we live a Christian life? Through the Holy Spirit. As a believer, we need to live a holy life according to the will of God, which is by the Holy Spirit. So the day you and I repented and accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, it was by the revelation through the Holy Spirit that we accepted him as our personal Savior. So each one of us on that day received the Holy Spirit to reside in us and help us. Holy living does not come from our performance to God, but through his performance in us through his Holy Spirit. Hence Paul says, it's not, no longer I 
but Christ living in me. Because if I live, I know it's the flesh that would lead me. But when I obey Christ, it's the Holy Spirit that guides me. The word walk, in Greek, peripatia, it's in the present tense. It means a continuous action. It's also imperative. It's a command to walk. It's the only way we can overcome the flesh. We've sung the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his whole, of his, of his glory and grace. While the Spirit is the source of all holy living, it's the believer, you and I, that's commanded to walk. So there's always going to be a tension between our flesh and the divine. Galatians 5, 17. Our desire is to walk with the spirit, but the conflict is with the flesh. The flesh here is the remains of the old man after a person is saved. We have two natures. One is the nature we are born with, and the other is the nature we have when we are born again. If you look at children, even babies, before the age of 12 months, they turn around when they go off and open a drawer they shouldn't, or a cupboard, and smile. They know it's wrong, hence they smile. Even two-year-olds brought up in Christian homes, never having heard lies, will lie. That's because of their lineage from Adam and earthly parents. Their flesh causes them to lie. When we are born, we're born with the nature of the flesh. When we, but when we're born again, because of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we have the nature of the Holy Spirit. So when we go out of church or go to conferences, we normally have that conviction that we're going to live holy lives. Yet, we all know that when we get home or walk out the door, things change. When reality hits us, flesh rises up. Paul himself is someone who has faced this conflict in Romans 7, verse 18, and I'm using the message version here. For I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. This is Paul, the architect and builder of the present day church, written after he was saved. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As Christians, we all go through this. I wake up in the morning wanting to start my day in prayer, but the flesh creeps in, and I want to sleep some more. We're all like that. It's a daily conflict. The flesh is that part of us that functions against the spirit. There are times in all our lives when the desire is there and the action just doesn't follow. I was reminded of an Indian songwriter and evangelist who worked tirelessly to spread the word of God. And he wrote many songs. And one day, after having done his mission, he reached home, only to find his wife and children standing outside their house with their bags packed. And 
when he asked his wife why, she said they'd been evicted from the house because they hadn't paid the rent. He had no idea what they were going to do, but he trusted the God who had led him thus far. So he turned to her and said, don't worry, I've got a house sorted for us. And he started to walk with his family. In that moment, he wrote a song that was birthed out of that circumstance. And I asked my mum to translate it for me. The words state, my God who is still on the throne, while still on the throne, due to his compassion, remembers me. There is no one to help me in this world. In this world, there is no one to help me. Those who know me walk past me as if they don't know me. Although my friends have left me, I am rejoicing as I know I have a Father in heaven and my help comes from the Lord. As he sang that song and walked with his family, a man drove up and stopped his car and stopped him. He got out of the car and said, I've just not been able to sleep all night. The Lord kept waking me up and telling me that I needed to come and see you. And he said I had to hand over the keys of my house, which I normally rent out to you. That is our God even today. If we just lift our eyes and look to him. This man, on his dying bed, spoke to a friend of his, who's an evangelist as well. Normally, on your deathbed, well, you would think that you're just waiting to be reunited with God. Yet he turned around to his friend, pinched his skin, and said, the flesh is still working today. So it's a daily conflict within the spirit and flesh. But the good news is we have victory in every area of sin as a believer. Because we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 to 24. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? This is Paul crying out about the afflictions of the flesh. But he provides an answer in Romans 8, verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So Holy Spirit is there to help us in that conflict between new creation and the flesh. The most effective way you can oppose the flesh is by starving it. And by that I mean, sometimes when we watch certain TV programs, you find that the flesh is stirred up. And that may be some conscious, but it means it's time to stop watching that. There could be harmless friendships in our lives, or relationships that we have that sometimes stir the flesh up. So it's important to detach yourself from that. By not feeding the desires of the flesh, we can starve it. The next few verses help us identify the people walking in the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the work of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. Verse 20. 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, immolations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, envying, murderers, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The problem with man is not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. We all battle this flesh to some degree. I've just grouped the deeds of the flesh just to go into it a bit more. Group one, immorality, impurity, and sensuality all feed the flesh. The area of illicit sexual activity affects man the most. That's the biggest cause of downfall. Because everywhere we look, be it adverts, children's programs, posters, it feeds the flesh. If a believer operates in this realm, then that person isn't walking in the spirit by, but by the flesh. Even if they attend church on a daily, weekly basis and actively participate in it. Idolatry and sorcery. Worshipping idols doesn't mean physical idols. They can be things like sports. Even our children can become idols. Work, money. If we replace the attention we should be giving God with these things, then they are idols in our life. Sorcery. It doesn't just refer to witchcraft. The origin of the word pharmakia in Greek means medicine, drugs, or spells. This is also driven by the flesh. Drug abuse, as we know, is a current addiction. That's flesh-led. Enmity, jealousy, outbursts of anger. We may not have group one or two tendencies, but in relationships with others, we might see this. We may worship on a Sunday morning, but go home and have strife with our neighbors, even our spouses. We could be jealous of people around us or angry with people. Road rage, angry with people at work, <laughs> or even home. This is all flesh-driven, not spirit-led. Drunkenness and orgies. What drugs are doing today, drunkenness did or has done and still continues to do in generations. In verse 21, Paul says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know anyone, including myself, that has not fallen into at least one of the above categories at some point in their Christian walk. Paul is not talking about this. He's not asking if we have fallen into these habits at some point or got caught up in this at some point in our lives. He is saying, if you are living these sort of lifestyles and convinced yourself and others around you that it is acceptable, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. We do have a God who, when we truly repent, welcomes us with open arms, forgives us and forgets what we have done. You cannot say you are born again and think these things are a part of Christian freedom. It is flesh driven. The unregenerate person might occasionally do good and the regenerate person might occasionally sin. Paul is referring to those regularly practice these things and he's calling us 
not to fall into these things even occasionally. We move on to walking according to the Spirit. If you look at the verses, when we read about the flesh, it says the deeds of the flesh. It's plural, the works of the flesh. But when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it's singular. It doesn't say the works of the Spirit. It's singular because all of the fruit should manifest in a believer. It's not a multiple choice tick box that we pick and choose from. If you walk in the Spirit, the fruit will naturally manifest in you. It's not manufactured, but a consequence of your walk in the Spirit. So from the time we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the fruit of the Spirit has already started manifesting in you. Even if you haven't realized it, you probably have changed some of the things that you would normally do. Some of the things that you naturally did would start repelling you. That is the work of the Spirit. In John chapter 15, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so you shall be my disciples. The Spirit never fails to produce fruit in a believer, but Jesus wants us to bear much fruit. So let us pray as a church that we do bear much fruit, which can only be achieved by obeying the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 7, 16 to 20, he shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. We have to stay in the true vine, that's Jesus Christ, to be able to manifest the fruit. So what is the fruit that we should be looking for in those who say they're living holy lives and walking in the Holy Spirit? The first one is love. This is the first and foremost fruit. The whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. He that loveth not his brother abided in death. Jesus told his disciples that it is by this that the world will know you are mine. He referred to love. It's not an option, it's a command. Jesus is the best example of love. Even on the cross, when he was beaten and weary, he turned to his father and said, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Jesus always showed love. So if we love Jesus, then there should be no other option but to love those around us. We often pray for people to be saved. But how often do we pray, Lord, fill us with your love to love those around us? The second is joy. Kara in Greek. 70, ti 70 times the word joy is used in the New Testament. The joy of the Lord, as we have sung many times in this church, has nothing to do with circumstances. Circumstances change. Money, illness, healing. But 
the joy of the Lord is forever. Psalm 16, 11 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The joy of the Lord bubbles up inside us when we are together, when we worship, when we fellowship. Even on our own, the Holy Spirit brings joy. Nehemiah, despite the turmoil that he went through in verse 8, in chapter 8, verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. In Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for joy that was set before him endured the cross for you and I. Whenever there's revival in a place, whenever rep reporters who are not of a Christian background reported, you find they always say, there's a strange kind of joy in that place. That's the joy of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice in the Lord always. If anyone has lost their joy today, ask for the Holy Spirit. Fill you so you live in the joy of the Lord always. Peace. For evidence of peace, look at your own homes. When there's chaos, it's the Holy Spirit that allows us to have peace. In the fullness of spirit, there is always peace. It doesn't mean there aren't problems. But as Lance said earlier, with Christ in my vessel, I can face any storm. He is the Prince of Peace. No one else can give us peace. That doesn't mean there won't be issues in life. But my favorite verse that has seen me through so many times of hardship, Romans 8, verse 28. And we know all things work together for good to them that love God to them that are called according to his purposes. Peace with God ensures that we have the peace of God, no matter what the circumstance. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave you, with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Patience. Not something I have, but I'm learning. We're always in a hurry to get to our destinations. Our God is such a patient God. He has dealt with us and continues to deal with us in a way that we don't really deserve. So we too must learn to be patient. In a busy world, take time to be patient. Kindness. In a world of social media, it's really important to show kindness. Let us not be reactive Sometimes we don't know the pain behind somebody's message on social media. So let us be kind when we respond to those messages. A little kindness can go a long way. Sometimes when we don't even really realize it, it has an impact on people's lives. Goodness. I was reminded of Joseph the carpenter, as an example of this. He decided to divorce Mary in secret so she wouldn't be disgraced publicly. It is said of him he was a good man. Let us show goodness to those around us. Galatians 6.10 reminds us, 
As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Faithfulness. We need to be faithful until death, as God is faithful to us. Gentleness. Jesus was gentle and humble in heart. So when we speak to our children, our spouses, people we work with, let us be gentle in our actions and our words. Self-restraint. Again, we need to exercise self-restraint. React slowly, not instantaneously. Sometimes we don't need to respond. God will respond on our behalf. Galatians 5.23 says, against these there is no law. The good news is we have a victorious life in the middle of conflict between flesh as long as we allow the spirit to lead us. Galatians 5.24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Our reassurance is that our old self was crucified with Christ. Not just for our sins. This is the mystery of the cross. It's far beyond our understanding. Romans 6, 5 to 6. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his re resurrection. So know this, that our old man is crucified with him and the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The old man has been paralyzed. Katageo is the Greek word for it, rendered useless. But we give it life. We give it steroids and bring it back to life when we do things, see things that we shouldn't. As believers, we have a new life in Christ. And we have a new way of life. So let us live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. Galatians 5, 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Don't put your interests above others. Proof of being a legalist is finding fault with others. Easily done. And we can all slide into that habit of finding fault with one another. In the pursuit of holiness, let's not become self-righteous or have pride piosity. We're all here by the grace of God. Not because of our works or our deeds, but because of his work on the cross for each one of us. And we are one body in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God, which give us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't give up when you fall. We all fall short, but God has given us victory. If we fall short in our words, God will give us victory. If we fall short in our thought life, he gives us victory. In our relationships, in our attitudes, he gives us victory. 
let us walk by the Spirit who gives us victory in Christian life. By staying in the line, we are guaranteed victory. As I was preparing this word, God reminded me on the 2nd of August, 1990, when I was 15 years old. I lived in Kuwait, and my life changed overnight as Kuwait was invaded by Iraq. Six months prior, in Kuwait, in, as being a Muslim country, we had one church where all the denominations met, different denominations, different cultures and faiths met in this one church and had different services through the day. God had sent an evangelist to Kuwait and he spoke in the church six months earlier and told us of a vision that God had given him of fire in the oil fields in Kuwait, of people running things coming. It's not that people didn't believe him, but we were comfortable in our lives. There was no sense of urgency. As a church, God has been speaking to us through Stephen and Liana with what's going around with the word. If we want to be a church of Philadelphia, as Steve preached, and as Liliana said about the kernels of wheat that fall to the ground and bear fruit, the only way we can do that is by yielding ourselves, examining our own hearts. We all fall short, but he's given us his Holy Spirit to live victorious lives. He's warning us to be ready, to ready ourselves. The word says we do not know the time. We don't need to know the time. All God is asking us to do is to be a church that's willing to yield to him so we can hear his voice and be led by his spirit. <laughs>